We have a great opportunity this morning to hear Brother Barry Gilreath Jr., a little bit about him before he does come up to take the podium. Uh, minister for the Jackson Heights Church of Christ in Florence, Alabama. He uh, additionally hosts the Fabric of Family, a work that Woodhaven uh, continually supports. Um, and it is a good work. I, uh, I hope and pray that you have opportunity to uh, check it out every morning. Um, see of you on mine uh, on 7 a.m. Uh, known Barry for quite some time. Uh, had opportunities to listen to him preach through uh, Gospel Broadcasting Network. And of course, he preached for some years for the Highland Congregation. We officially met in 2008 when uh, the elders of the Highland Congregation uh, asked Willard and I to come over, so they wanted to uh, meet with uh, this new congregation that had started in Chatsworth at the time. Uh, we've been friends ever since. I do appreciate Barry. I appreciate everything that he does to continue <coughs> preaching the gospel in spirit and in truth. Um, he was originally to be with us in January, but um, the weather did not permit it so. Uh, we were trying to find a time that was mutually agreeable upon both. And I said, I don't think we're going to get any snow in June. So let's shoot for that. This time I'd like to turn the podium over to Mr. Barry Gilding, Jr. Well, thanks again, uh, Kevin. Thank you to the uh, Woodhaven congregation here for your kind invitation uh, to be with you on this Lord's Day. I know this is a busy time for so many people. I know you have some who are normally here who uh, uh, got word I was going to be in town. And <laughs> no, actually I know some are uh, on vacation that would normally be here. Uh, I know there's uh, another special day going on uh, at another congregation uh, with a speaker. Um, so uh, there's several things that are competing for uh, attendance uh, today. And it just is a busy time, a lot of people traveling. But I am thankful that you're here. And I just want to say how much I appreciate, again, the congregation here, your support, uh, our association, uh, the association that, that I've had with uh, those who are members here over the years. Uh, you are very much uh, close to my heart, and I appreciate what you are, what you're doing. And I wish you well, and pray the Lord will continue to bless you and your family, and your efforts in the kingdom. You know, it ought to be the desire of every single member of the body of Christ to strengthen the local church in every way possible. If you think about what we have in our hands, what has been given to us, we are part of the greatest organization that has ever been known by man, that being the church of Christ. God has given us the greatest commission that we could possibly have. No commission is greater in scope, in message, than the one that was given by Jesus. To go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. We have the greatest management team. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. You can't get a better management team to get your marching orders from, to give you direction, than God Himself. We have the greatest message that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And we have the greatest benefit to offer to those who are in the world, and that is the gift of eternal life to Jesus Christ our Lord. Now because of all that God has given us, it ought to be the desire of every single member of the body of Christ to do everything that we can. Or I, I can say it like this, everything I can to build up and to strengthen the body of Christ, the congregation that I'm associated in work and labor with. I hope that is your goal and your desire and your ambition as a member of the Woodhaven congregation to build the church up here, to be God's servant, to be faithful, to be dependable. Because you know dependability is something that's very important. We appreciate dependability in many aspects of our life. In fact, I'd say all aspects of our life. You know, we want a dependable car, don't we? 
personally, I don't want a, a vehicle that I'm going to have to tinker with and, and try to get it to, to start every time I need to go somewhere. Now, sometimes people, uh, that's just the kind of car they have and they can't do anything about it. But if I have my choices about it, I want one that's going to be dependable. I think about air conditioning unit this time of the year. And you know, I want my air conditioning unit to be dependable. When I go into the room and want it to be cool, I want to push the button for it to come on. Hot water heater. There's something else that we want it to be dependable. There's nothing worse than stepping into the shower and there's no hot water. And it freezes you to death. You want that hot water heater to be dependable. We want dependable jobs. We want to know that we're going to have a place to, to go and to work and to make money for our family so that we can continue to enjoy the existence that God has given us next week and a month down the road and even a year down the road. I don't know. You may not have a dependable car. You are certainly going to have problems occasionally with an air conditioning unit being mechanical. It's going to fail. Water heaters, occasionally they go out on us. Sometimes a job, we may think, is very stable, but something happens and it's not as stable as we thought. I don't know about dependability in other areas of your life, but I know this, that if you are a Christian, if you are a child of God, God is dependable. And you can count on God every single time. He's not going to let you down, not even once. You have a dependable Lord. But the question that I want us to consider this morning is this. Can He depend on you? Have you not heard? Jesus the Savior came down from above. Came to bring mercy and love. Crucify Him, the mob scornfully cried. and So on Calvary He died. While on the cross He prayed, Father, forgive, for they know not what they do. For us, He died that we might live. But can He depend on you? Can He depend on you, His blessed will to do? Will you be crowned with the faithful and the true? Can He depend on you? We want God to be dependable, and He is. The question this morning is, are we dependable? Can God count on us to do what He wants us to do? What is the greatest need in the church today? Now think about that. What do you think the greatest need in the church is today? If we were to go around the room and ask that question, perhaps we would get different responses. And no doubt all of these responses would be valid and someone could make an argument that this is a great need that the church has. Sometimes we think in terms like this, though. The greatest need the church has is a, is a bigger facility, maybe, or, or maybe a, a fatter bank account, or, or what we need is a, a more eloquent preacher, or, or we need this in our leadership. And, and we come up with all of these different things we think that the church needs that would help us to be more effective. Let me add one thing to your list. One thing that we need in the church today that can help us to be effective. They can enable us to have an influence in the world today like we need to have and must have. And it's service. But not just any old kind of service. Dependable service. We live in a world that wants to be catered to. People want to know, well, what are you going to do for me? And how is this going to benefit me? And so we should not be surprised that the world is full of Churches that seek to cater to the masses. But what the world needs and what the church needs is not more people saying, well, what can the church do for me? But more people in the church saying, what can I do for the Lord? Amen. What can I do for those who are in need? We need more people like Jesus Christ who got down on His knees and He, he washed dirty feet. He took a towel of service and served others. We need more people in the church who are willing to do that rather than say, how can I be served by the town? I want to talk with you this morning about service. I want to talk with you this morning not about just any old service because you might have a car that services you, but it services you maybe a few days a week because 
you're constantly having to tinker with it. There's a difference between service and dependable service. And that's what I want to talk with us about this morning. I want us to think about how that we can grow the church. How that we can serve God and be successful as a congregation. And I want to address this subject through the topic of discipleship. Discipleship. You know, the word disciple is a very interesting word. You don't have to go very far in your New Testament before you're going to run right into that word. In fact, over in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 35, the text simply says, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples. And then in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 15, in those days Peter stood up in the midst of his disciples. Again, two books. In the very first chapter of both of those books, you run right into that word. Well, the word disciple is not a word that is used rarely in the Bible. In fact, it's used very often in the Scriptures. In fact, the word disciple is found over 250 times in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. Now, if you were in school, and if your teacher was preparing you for a test, and the teacher said, uh, okay, I want you to read this material. And if in this material there was a concept that was found over 250 times, do you not think that it would be worth your while to know a little bit about that concept? To know a little bit about what that word implied? What that topic was about? You see, brethren, the book here that I hold before you, the Word of God, is a book that we're going to be judged by. John chapter 12, verse 48, Jesus said, The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge a man in the last day. And in this book, we find that there is a concept that is mentioned over 250 times in the Gospels and in the book of Acts, and it is the word disciple. Would we not be wise to know a little bit about this Word, to know what is implied by this Word? Because we use this Word and even apply it to ourselves, and hopefully we use it properly. Are you a disciple? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? I hope so. Because you see, one's salvation is dependent upon it. Someone says, I'm a disciple of Christ, am I not? I mean, I've obeyed the gospel of Christ. I'm at the services every time the door is open. I follow the good golden rule. I treat people like I would want to be treated. Doesn't that make me a disciple? Well, maybe and maybe not. You know what the word means? You know what the word implies? You see, someone could have obeyed the gospel of Christ in the past. Someone could even be present for the assembly of the saints. But that in and of itself does not mean that they are a disciple in the truest sense of the word. Because do you know what the word means? The word disciple means a learner. Am I a learner? The word disciple implies that I am a student. And a disciple says, there is my Lord. Whatever He says, that's what I'm going to do. Wherever He wants me to go, that's where I'll go. Whatever the task, whatever the sacrifice, it is not too great. I will discipline myself and I will obey. That's a disciple. Does that word describe you this morning? You know, we live in a time in which Sadly, it could be described as a time of casual Christianity. You know, when you're blessed and when you feel affluent, you tend to rely less upon God. You go to other parts of the world where they have literally nothing and you'll find some of the most dedicated and faithful Christians that you could ever meet. But we live in a time of casual Christianity. A lot of people want to claim to be disciples of Jesus Christ. They believe that because they were baptized in the past in their life and because they come to the assembly, then that makes them a disciple. And it is true, they were a disciple up to a certain point in time, but they've not continued to be a disciple. They've not continued to be a learner. 
You see, someone who is a casual Christian, as we might describe it, is someone who wants to be numbered among the flock, but they don't really care about following the shepherd. It is someone who wants a connection with the Lord's church, but they don't want to do the work of the Lord's church. They want to hear that sermon on Sunday mornings that makes them feel good, but they offer no commitment to Jesus Christ come Monday morning. They want the crown of Christ, but they don't want the hardships of the cross. They want to be a disciple, but they don't want the responsibilities of being a disciple. Do you know that there's a cost involved in being a disciple of Christ? We need to know that. We need to know that there is a cost in being Christ's disciple. Before we ever begin the journey in the Christian walk of life, we ought to know that there is a cost involved. You know our Lord in Luke chapter 14 verse 38 said, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost? whether he has sufficient to finish it. I wonder how many in here have built a home. Perhaps some of you have. Charles Hackney, you built a home before, had Yeah, I thought so. Do you not sit down and count the cost before you do that? Do you just give the, uh, the builder a set of plans and say, now this is what we're going to build, go to it? No. If you're getting financing from a bank, you can rest assured they're going to want to make sure you've counted the cost. And Jesus says, what manner of you intending to build a tower doesn't sit down first and count the cost whether he has sufficient to finish it? Why is it that some who began discipleship, they don't make it to the end? Why is it that some who began their life in Christ drift away is it because they did not count the cost? A number of years ago, there was a commercial on television. It was a commercial that I, I found somewhat humorous because it illustrates what we're talking about. Maybe you saw it. But there was a man who was sitting in a chair in a tattoo parlor. And he had his beloved by his side. And uh, her name was Donna. And he was going to impress her by having... Uh, I love Donna tattooed on his arm and so he's sitting there in the chair and uh, the tattoo artist is working and about halfway through the procedure the man in the chair says now how much is this going to cost and the tattoo artist says it's going to cost $50 and he reaches into his pocket he pulls out and he says but I only have $40 and there's a brief lapse in time and the next thing you see the man is standing out in front of the tattoo parlor with uh, his girlfriend there beside him and she's really letting him have it and then she walks away all angry and he yells out, but I'll get it fixed, I'll get it fixed. And then the camera gives a close-up of his arm and it says, I love Don. <laughs> I won't get it fixed too. We well, say he didn't count the cost, did he? He didn't count the cost. You know, we live in a world of <clears throat> handouts and easy does it. Now, we, we need to help those who are in need. That's not what we're talking about this morning. But I think that you would agree with me that there are a lot of folks who tend to think that the world owes them everything, and that includes God Himself. And sometimes people will say, well, I want to be a disciple, but this is the way they really think. I want to be a disciple on my turn. As long as it doesn't get too difficult, as long as it doesn't require much sacrifice, as long as I get to dictate what I will and will not do, then I want to be a disciple. It kind of reminds me of some of the responses that were given to uh, members of the Bridger Wilderness area in the year 1996. These were comic cards. They were given by those who visited the wilderness area as kind of suggestions. They were given to the staff there. And here's some of the actual responses from uh, these tourists who visited the Bridger Wilderness Area in 1996. One tourist wrote, Trails need to be reconstructed. Please avoid building trails that go uphill. Another one wrote, Too many bugs and leeches and spiders and spider webs. Please spray the wilderness to get rid of these pests. Another wrote, please pave the trail. 
chair lifts need to be in some places so that we can get to the wonderful views without having to hike to them. Another one wrote, the coyotes made too much noise last night and kept me awake. Please eradicate these annoying animals. Another one said, a small deer came into my camp and stole my jar of pickles. Is there any way I can get reimbursed? Please call. Another said, escalators would help on the steep uphill section. Someone else suggested, maybe a McDonald's would be good at the trailhead. Someone else said, too many rocks in the mountains. Is there anything you can do about this? And you see, these responses of these visitors demonstrate the ignorance that some have about visiting a wilderness area. And friends, the same is true regarding what some think it means to be a disciple of Christ. You see, some think that being a disciple of Christ simply means you, you do a few things and as long as you, you, you do these and everything's fine. And they do not truly comprehend the biblical definition of discipleship. And they're like those in John chapter 6, verse 66, who were following Jesus up to a point. But when Jesus began to teach on things that went contrary to what they wanted to believe, the Bible says they turned back and they walked no more with Him. You know, in our scripture reading this morning, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 46 through 49, Jesus addressed this in a very straightforward manner. He said, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? And then he began to illustrate it. He said, uh, The one who does that is like the man who builds his house the foundation of on the sand. And then uh, when the storm comes, the water comes, then his house falls. But the one who hears and does my sayings, he's like the one who builds his house upon a solid foundation. You see, a disciple is one who builds his house upon the solid foundation. He trusts completely and fully in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Jesus says, that's what He does. You see, to serve Jesus Christ to be a Christian is going to cost us something. And what is it going to cost us? It can be summarized in one word. Everything. It's going to cost all. Everything. Lord, on Your altar, O my Lord divine, accept my gift this day for Jesus' sake. I have no jewels to adorn Your shrine, no world fame sacrifice to make. And here I bring with my trembling hands this will of mine, a thing that seems small, yet you alone can understand that when I yield you this, I yield you all. Are you a disciple of Christ? Have you given Him your all? What is it that you're holding back from Jesus this morning? What command do you consider to be too steep, too high a price to pay, in comparison to what Jesus did for us. You know, Jesus taught in Luke chapter 14, verse 33, that unless we're willing to sacrifice all, we cannot be His disciple. You know, for some people, that means that relationships have to be sacrificed. Relationships that they could have with their family. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus dealt with that. You know, there's some uh, times in which if someone obeys the gospel, their family will cut them off, won't have anything to do with them. That happens. Maybe it's happened in your family. Sometimes it may cost you your livelihood because you could make a whole lot more money and uh, be successful in the eyes of the world if you did this or that, but you choose to live a different way because you want to live for Christ. It may cost you your livelihood. It may cost you things that there's nothing wrong with them in and of itself, but just innocent things, recreational interests, because you see, you choose to assemble with God's people on the first day of the week rather than be out on the lake or maybe on the golf course. It may cost you many things. It may cost you your attitude. But I want you to understand that when you become a disciple of Christ, it's not just simply cost, but it's also gain. Because there are things that you're going to gain when you choose to be Christ's disciple. You're going to grow stronger as a person than you ever believed were possible. 
You're going to have a foundation that Jesus talked about. One that is solid. One that you can build your life upon. One that will stand the test of time. You're going to have stability in an unstable world. You know, the world's constantly changing. What's right today may not be right tomorrow in the eyes of the world. But you see, God's Word doesn't change. And so you're going to have stability in this unstable world. And you're going to be blessed in more ways than you ever believed were possible. Tom Landry, famous former coach of the Dallas Cowboys. You know, the Dallas Cowboys used to be the thing. They did for a period of time. I mean, they were the team. And Tom Landry tells about how that uh, they had worked and worked as a team and they finally, finally made it to that first Super Bowl. And how that year after year they had come so close, but finally, finally that victory came. And he said that after the game was over, after they won, they were in the, the, the locker room there, and how that there was an overwhelming sense of emotion that was being felt by the team. But he said, you know, in a few days, he said that overwhelming emotion was replaced with an overwhelming feeling of emptiness. And he said some of the players even commented, Coach, there has to be something more. Yes, there is something more. And it is a daily walk with Jesus Christ as your Lord. The poet wrote, only one life will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. I want to encourage you to count the cost of being a disciple of Christ. Understand that you cannot be a disciple of Christ on a part time basis. To understand that to be a disciple of Christ is a continual process. It's not something you just did in the past, it's something you continue to do because the word means that you are a learner and you continue to learn and apply the things that you learn. And that to be a disciple of Christ is going to cost you something. What? It's going to cost you all, it's going to cost you everything. I want to close this morning with a, a poem that I like. I don't know who wrote it, but I want to share it with you. And I hope that this poem can be inspirational to you as you think about your life of service to Christ Jesus. I am a soldier in the army of my God. The Lord Jesus Christ is my commanding officer. The Holy Bible is my code of conduct. Faith and prayer and the Word are my weapons of warfare. I have been taught through the Word by the Holy Spirit, trained by experience, tried by adversity, and tested by fire. I am a volunteer in this army, and I am enlisted for eternity. I will either retire in this army when the Lord returns, or I will do so after the judgment of man. But I will not get out, sell out, be talked out, pushed out. I am faithful, reliable, capable, dependable. If my God needs me, I am there. I am committed. I cannot have my feelings hurt bad enough to turn me around. I cannot be discouraged enough to turn me aside. I cannot lose enough to cause me to quit. If I end up with nothing, I'll still come out ahead. I will win. My God has and will continue to supply all my needs. I am more than a conqueror. I will always triumph. I can do all things through Christ. The devil cannot defeat me. People cannot disillusion me. Weather cannot weary me. Sickness cannot stop me. Battles cannot beat me. And money cannot buy me. Governments cannot silence me. And hell cannot handle me. For I am a soldier in the army of God. And I'm marching and claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I'm a soldier marching. And I'm heaven bound. That's what we all ought to be striving for. We ought to be striving to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, faithful, true, and dependable. Yes, Jesus came down from heaven above. He came to bring mercy and love. But on the cross, He died. You can depend on Jesus. The question is, can He depend on you? Song of Invitation has been selected. I believe it's uh, I'm resolved, but we're going to sing that song. And uh, if there's someone here this morning who wants to begin a relationship with Christ Jesus in your obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ, 
All things are ready. You can do that. If you'll make your way down the aisle and have a seat on the front row, uh, one of the elders will assist you. If you have another spiritual need in your life, you're a child of God. Oh, you're a soldier of Christ, but maybe you've been AWOL. Maybe you've not been living as you should. Maybe you want to rededicate your life to Christ this morning. We sing this song. We encourage you to come right now as we stand and sing. <laughs>